would, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I do want to begin reading in verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly, in unbelief and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Yesterday was Independence Day. It was celebrated by people shooting off explosives near my house and across town where I could hear them. I happened to look at uh, Google and the Wikipedia entry and this was the definition I read and part of it hit me at the end here. It says, Independence Day of the United States, also referred to as 4th of July or July 4th in the U.S., is a federal holiday commemorating the adoption of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, by the Continental Congress declaring that the 13 American colonies regarded themselves as a new nation. And it struck me that believers are to regard themselves as members of the household of God, as the sons and daughters of God, as heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, because we are. And we are to regard ourselves as that. Anyhow, that was just something extra. I like that. Believers are special people. They have been blessed of God, no matter where they are. Anyhow, this is Paul's first letter to Timothy. And he starts off with his introduction. And he tells us his purpose in having Timothy, why he had to read, write this letter was he left Timothy in Ephesus. But he left Timothy in Ephesus for a reason. Verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This is why he left Timothy there. There evidently was a tendency to have a problem with doctrine. And he besought Timothy that you charge some, that's what it says, because it doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter who. Whoever it is, they better not teach any other doctrine than that which Paul taught. Because if you're doing that, that means you're preaching another gospel, which is not another, and let him be accursed. 
Paul was dead serious about this. So serious, he left Timothy there who he trusted, who knew the gospel. Oh, come on. How important is doctrine really? Well, doctrine is more important than this world will ever know. Sound teaching doctrine is the only way that we have to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of his word that he left us. He gave us. And he tells you to study to show thyself approved. I said a couple weeks ago, study what? Study the scriptures. It is important because later on, actually in the uh, in Ephesians 4, the letter he wrote to the Ephesians, verse 14, he wrote that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. False doctrine is what people want to deceive you with. Now... My wife was listening to something on the internet. I don't know whether it was Friday or yesterday. And I mentioned it to her. The doctrine of this world, one of the doctrines of this world, is called evolution. See, they want to say that we were descended from animals. That's where we came from. That's wrong, and that's a lie. They teach it as a fact. It doesn't even qualify scientifically as a theory. And if you espouse a different opinion, a different belief, they'll laugh at you. Because they think you, you just don't know anything. You're one of them ignorant Bible-believing people. No, to say that our behavior is because we are descended from animals the behavior of man as he's born that's an insult to animals yeah. animals don't behave like man does that's right. animals don't the problem with man is that he's fallen he's totally depraved and it's only the restraining hand of the Spirit of God that keeps us from being even worse than we are. But that's the doctrine of that this world. One of us. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. Anyhow, we as believers are to steadfastly continue in the Apostles' doctrine. That's what it said they did in Acts. They continued. But not only did they continue, they continued steadfastly. And this is an evidence that God has worked a work in you. This is an evidence that you are his workmanship. I will tell you this. You can start to know Christ and, st and some... <laughs> When you start to know Christ, that doesn't mean you love every part of his message. There are things you'll fight against. There's things you'll hate, Walter. Even when God's done something for you. But, however, you cannot love Jesus Christ. Hate his message and stay that way. He'll fix it. He'll fix it. And you will continue steadfastly in his doctrine. Because there is no other doctrine. There is no other message. There is no other Lord. There is no other faith. And this is what Paul was leading to here where he says, And I thank Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He starts off being enabled. It wasn't a Paul himself. It was not a Paul. Paul had to be enabled. 
and he had to be enabled by Christ Jesus. Without this enabling, the word means empowerment. Without Christ's strength, there is no ministry. And I love the way he, he, he wrote it. He put me into it. This was not what Paul was looking for. That's going to come clear later. Paul was not looking to be a minister. God enabled him and Christ put him into the ministry. He made the ministry. Well, Paul, oh, Paul was put in the ministry because he was faithful. No, that's not what that says. And it's not what it teaches. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful. He didn't say I was faithful and God put me in the ministry. No, he counted me faithful. What? Counted me full of faith. He gives faith. He enables and he put Paul into this ministry. He put Paul as an apostle right here writing this letter to Timothy at that particular time and everything before it and everything after it. It was because of the work of Jesus Christ. And he admits, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, this is verse 13, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now I do want to state this. Ignorance is not an excuse. For some people, it's a state of being, but it's not an excuse. And the thing is, also, Christ Jesus did not leave Paul ignorant. In that case, Saul of Tarsus ignorant. It was done ignorantly in unbelief. Paul didn't know Jesus Christ. At all. That's who he was persecuting was the people who believed Christ. The people who believed Jesus. That's who he was a blasphemer against. That's who he was a persecutor of and injurious toward. The people of God. An ignorant unbeliever at that time Saul was faithless. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly ab exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And I do want to say this, God's grace is always exceeding abundant. Walter talked about it last week. Sin doesn't beat grace. Grace beats sin. Grace is always exceeding abundant. He that is forgiven much, loveth much. And Paul's already confessed here his sins, what he did. Even though he did it ignorantly, he did it. He owned up. He knew what he was. But God's grace was exceeding abundant to him. And it's exceeding abundant to you if you know him. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now this is a statement full of faith. Faithful saying the faith of God's elect and it's worthy of all acceptation now it will be accepted only by some but it's worthy of all acceptation 
The world will not accept that statement. The natural man cannot accept that statement. But God's people will. Why? Because of an exceeding, abundant grace of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That is a statement of purpose. The purpose of Christ, which means it's the purpose of God, which means it's the purpose of the Father, which means it shall be done. The words have gone out of my mouth and they will not return unto me void. They will accomplish that for which I sent them. God's purposes are never thwarted. No matter what God's purposes are. But this is the flat out statement. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, did he or didn't he? That's the question. That's the question the world doesn't know the answer to. And the ones that got an answer in the world, they got the wrong answer. Because Christ Jesus did save his people from their sins. The redemption was accomplished. It was shown by the Father, by the Son, by the Spirit in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God laid this to us. God is true and every man is a liar. And God raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead because he was the complete perfect sacrifice and it wasn't fit that death should hold him. Now let's get to what I wanted to talk about. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. This is another flat statement from Paul. Paul's not asking questions. He's giving out information. I think he's actually might be proclaiming doctrine here. How be it, nevertheless, notwithstanding, contrarywise, I obtained mercy. Now, I did not go out and obtain it. That's a passive verb. I was given mercy. And it's called mercy because Paul said it just before this. He deserved death. And we all do. Mercy by definition is something when you get, when you deserve the exact opposite. You should be punished. I should be punished. Paul says he should have been punished. But God punished Christ in our stead. And therefore, because of that, because of him, I obtained mercy. I was given mercy. And it says that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Now, I do want to say this about long suffering. Just quote Second Peter. Chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a lot of people like to quote that verse, but they like to live out that little piece to usward. Say, God's not willing that anybody... No, he's long-suffering to usward, and he's not willing that any of usward should perish. That's who it is. Peter's just as specific as Paul, who's just as specific as John, who's just as specific as what God told them to write down. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this was written. 
And if you would actually read on a little bit, you'd read 2 Peter 3 and verse 15. It says, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord what, is salvation. Even as our, brother, our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll see that the long-suffering of God was mentioned several times in the place with spoken of God's mercy. But what I really wanted to talk about this morning is this pattern. Paul states this plainly. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that it, be, that it be first. Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Now, what is this pattern about? Well, I believe it refers directly back to verse 15. About a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. This is what Paul's referring to. The pattern that you will see in the Apostle Paul's salvation is the pattern and then what he says here, hereafter. So if you would, I was going to look at Acts chapter 9. Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord and went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. <coughs> Verse 3, and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul Saul why persecutest thou me and he said who art thou Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. This is Paul, then known as Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus to persecute more of the followers of Jesus Christ. Now from this interaction, I got four different things here. There's more, I'm sure, but I got four and they're subdivided. So, But the first point I see here in Paul's pattern is that Saul was not seeking the Lord. As a matter of fact, it was the exact opposite of seeking. He was trying to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ and his people. How do you persecute the Lord Jesus Christ? Right now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. Well, this is how. You persecute his people. You offend his people. You hate his people. You hate him. Yeah. Yeah. You're persecuting him. Yeah. I'm not the offended party when somebody sp speaks against me because of Christ. Right. Now I might be the offended party if they're speaking against me because of me. But if it has to do with the gospel, that's an offense against Christ. And he, he will deal with it yes. there's a place where he says I will repay 
and he will. But see, if somebody persecutes you, if somebody talks bad about you, if somebody denigrates you because of the word, because of his word, and Christ said they will hate you, they're after him. And don't worry about you being offended. He's offended for you. That was the accusation. Paul said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. That's his word, not mine. That's the words of Christ. You persecute my people, you're persecuting me. And he may allow it for a while, but he will recompense. There will come a reckoning for those who have persecuted the people of God. For those who have offended the household of God. Because God says, I'm offended by it. That's who sins against. Sin is against God. It's not against you. It's not against me. But Saul was not seeking the Lord. <laughs> well, he thought he knew the Lord. He didn't, but he thought he did. Because I'm going to tell you something. When Paul wrote Romans 10, he knew exactly what he was talking about when he was talking about his brethren. They have a zeal of God, but not according to what? knowledge Saul of Tarsus was right there right here in Acts 9 he had a zeal of God this man was going to Damascus Syria to persecute some people that he thought were offending his God I'm going to tell you something that's seriously serious zeal but not according to knowledge Saul was going about to establish his own righteousness and had not submitted himself to the righteousness of God at that time he was persecuting Jesus by persecuting his people Saul was not seeking the Lord Jesus Christ and then the second point I got written down, Saul did not know the Lord. And this is self-evident because of self-testimony. Lord, he said, said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, this is Saul, who art thou? Now, later on, you can read. Paul says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, the tribe of Benjamin. I was born a Jew of Jews, of the tribe of Benjamin, as touching the law, what? A Pharisee. As touching the righteousness of the law, blameless. And yet, when the Lord spoke from heaven, the first thing Paul had to ask, Saul of Tarsus had to ask, was, who are you? Because it doesn't matter what you know, because you're not going to know him until he reveals himself. Saul didn't know the Lord. He thought he did. He had the best religious education. This world had, and I mean, he had the Old Testament scriptures and knew them and studied them. There was a statement in an account that our Lord gave where there was a rich man in hell. And there's a statement Abraham made in there where he told that rich man who wanted somebody to send Lazarus back so he could t tell my brothers not to come here. And Abraham said, they've got Moses and the prophets. He says, oh, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't listen to them. They send somebody back from the dead, they, him they'll listen to. And Abraham said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, they're not going to hear one, even though he rose from the dead. 
and that's what we're surrounded with this world right now who will not hear one who did raise from the dead and who always spoke the truth and who spoke the truth after and his men wrote down this truth the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. And there comes a time, and I don't care, well, I, I do care, it doesn't matter if you were born and raised in a sovereign grace church that preached the truth. It doesn't matter how orthodox your knowledge is, how well you've been taught mentally, it doesn't matter. If he doesn't come and reveal himself unto you, you're not going to know him. Now, he did this visibly. He did this physically. Paul heard him. Paul saw the light. This, what, this is not how it's done now. But it is what a pattern. It is an individual revelation of Jesus Christ to each and every individual child of God. Because you don't know Christ unless he reveals himself to you. However, point three, the Lord knew Saul. <laughs> That's the glory. That's the glory. Here's this man on his way to persecute Jesus. You know, he didn't say, I'm Christ Jesus. I'm the Lord Jesus. He said, no, I said, I'm, he said, I'm Jesus. He was a man. He is a man. He always shall be a man. He is the God man, nonetheless. But I'm the one you're persecuting. But he called him by name. The first word that Saul heard from the Lord was Saul, Saul. He could have just let him go on. He could have struck him dead. He knocked him off his donkey. Could have been like Balaam had an angel standing there waiting to cut his head off. But the Lord Jesus Christ knew Saul. And this was the time and this was the place he chose to stop Saul in his tracks. And he did. He called him by name. Now, the Lord was not seeking Saul, but he found him. He knew exactly where he was at. He knew exactly where he was at. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew why he was doing it. Paul tells us back in 1 Timothy. He was doing it ignorantly in unbelief. He did it ignorantly. Who art thou, Lord? I understand you're Lord. You're talking to me out of a light in the sky. I hear your voice, but I don't know who you are. That's an experience. And that's an experience that actually comes to every child of God. Not to this degree, not to this way. As far as I know, God does not appear to people. I've never heard a testimony lately or in print where God did and somebody spoke the truth afterwards, Mason. There's lots of people that talk about God appeared to me, but they don't speak the truth of this word. They're still ignorant and unbelief. They're still a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. See, God didn't, Christ did not leave Saul of Tarsus here. He knew him, he called him, and guess what? Saul answered. He called him by name. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was not seeking Saul, he was calling Saul of Tarsus. 
Those that are predestinated, them are those that he calls. Those that he calls, them are them that he justifies. And right down the line. There's a nice perfect sequence of events in Romans chapter 8. And this is the beginning of it from Saul's point of view. But it's not the beginning of it from the Lord Jesus Christ's point of view. He didn't, Saul didn't know Christ, but Christ knew Saul. And he called him by name. Saul answered. Saul followed. That's point four. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou perse persecutest. It is, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I'll give you this for free. Saul was pricked. He was goaded with a sharp stick. That's what it means. An ox goad. Get along. Before the revelation of Jesus Christ. Something had been going on. It's a valid question. It's a good question. Which comes first, life or faith? And the answer is life. Now, how close together they are, who knows? I don't know. I know there was a big, I know there was a little bit of a gap in mine. Because I, had, I, I remember what it's like to be goaded, to be pricked. You don't know what's right, but you know something's wrong. You don't know who's right, but sometimes you know who's wrong. Usually it was me. But I found people were lying to me. Or at least not telling me the truth. They may have sincerely believed what they were saying. And I didn't know him. Not then. But there come a day when I heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, he's true. I read it in this book. And I could read it and I could see, this is right. I don't know how to explain it, and hopefully I don't have to explain it to you because you should know what it is. But there comes a time when you're reading the scriptures or you'll hear somebody preach and you'll say, oh my gosh, that's right, I've known that all along. That can't be nothing but true. And it is true. There are pricks, there are goads, but then there comes a time when you see him and he speaks and you follow. The good shepherd calls his sheep by name. And, not if, and they follow. What do they do? They continue steadfastly in the apostle's doctrine. And this is a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him. There was some different things done in the different times. In the Old Testament, there were sacrifices to be offered. Now salvation is none other than Christ, even in the Old Testament. But there were a different typifications back then. But this is what Paul says here. From hereafter, this is the way God does it. He used me as a pattern. You're not going to be seeking him, but he's going to find you. You don't know him, but he knows you. And he brings you in. He picks up that lost sheep, puts it on his shoulder, and he went and carries it back. And where's that lost sheep going? That lost sheep's going back. And he will make you willing and happy about it. But you will follow him. You'll hear his voice. And a stranger you will not follow. He's the pattern. 
maker. Jesus Christ. This is what he's given us, this gospel, to preach. For his sheep to hear and to believe his gospel. And what's it all from? Paul had already told us in verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love. You will believe him. And you will love him. And you will love his word. And it's all by his marvelous, free, sovereign, exceeding abundant grace. Faith and love are the fruit of the Spirit. They're the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this is the pattern hereafter that we continue. This is the pattern for now. This is the pattern for later. It's all the work of Jesus whom Saul persecuted. And we follow. We follow him. We try to follow his word. Remember that one, Walter? We, we talked about this 30 years ago or so, more. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. We used to pick at people because they preach if you're enduring at the end, you'll be saved. Because they think you can get it and lose it and get it and lose it and get it and lose it. Well, you can if it's yours. But if it's his salvation, it's eternal salvation. If he's given you life, he's given you eternal life. His word will never return unto him void. And every one of his sheep, he's going to call by name. They're going to hear him. They're going to follow him. Because it's his work. It's his grace. It's his love. It's his mercy. It's his righteousness. It's all his. And we are given it in him. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this time, this place. Thank you. For your son, our Lord. Thank you. For life. For love. Faith. Goodness, meekness, temperance. All of the gifts that come down from you. Through your son, our Lord. Amen. Amen.